Hello, and welcome to another edition of History on Tape, where we talk to historians about their work and ideas. My name is Oscar Broughton, and today I'm joined by a professor here at the Freie Universität Berlin, who works on the history of Latin America and global history. He specializes in the history of Argentina and has written extensively on topics such as nationalism and migration. Today we'll be discussing the new and expansive field of global urban history, the topic of migration, and his latest book, Anti-Imperial Metropolis, Interwar Paris and the Seeds of Third World Nationalism. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome, Michael Gobel. Hello. Hello. So, to begin with your book, um, you begin with a remark about how the future Vietnamese revolutionary Ho Chi Minh and the future Chinese premier Zhao Enlai lived and worked a mere a thousand meters from each other in Paris between 1919 and 1921. Can you unpack the significance of this and what does your, why does your book really start with this remark uh, and what does this tell us about Paris during this period? So I, I begin with those two individuals merely because because they capture perhaps the attentiveness of the audience because because they later became so famous and and important in in political history um, and but their presence in Paris I suppose shows the cosmopolitanism of the environment um, the the various different places from from which people were drawn to Paris and in particular how how Paris became what in the book I call a hatchery of later third world nationalism um, for which in particular Ho Chi Minh of course stands and and so does uh, Zhou Enlai to some extent so so that's the reason why I why I use these two individuals as an opener of of the book so to speak but why make Paris the center of this book and why not other cities such as Berlin or New York or London which also fostered in anti-imperial activities during this period? Yeah, I, so there's various reasons for that. Um, autobiographically speaking, the, the, the simplest one was that I'm, as you said earlier, a Latin Americanist by training and I became interested in Paris as a site for the exchange between Latin American intellectuals. And for Latin Americans, of course, uh, culturally and intellectually speaking, Paris was much more important than, than London or Berlin ever were, or, or even New York, um, in particular in this, in this period. So, so, so that was why I was drawn, how I was drawn to Paris in the first place. But for, from a broader global angle, and, and the book then eventually became much more, not so much about Latin Americans, but people from the French Empire. Um, so in that sense, it became more global because, because Africans, North Africans, um, Southeast Asians, Vietnamese in particular, were, were in there. But in, in a general comparison to other European cities at the time, um, Paris attracted, first of all, a lot more people from non-European um, backgrounds. Paris attracted more immigrants than any other European city in general. So this also goes for Italians or Poles, um, largely because the French labor market had had more shortages than 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 those of other European countries. Um, but uh, Paris also attracted a, a greater diversity of of people from from around the world. So so in many ways, the arguments that I try to make in the book work better for Paris than they would have for London. Although, of course, London famously was also important for, you know, um, for uh, as being a place in which um, elite Africans got educated and where, where people like Jomo Kenyatta um, made first political uh, experiences and so forth. Um, but but the, the argument as a whole, I think, works better for Paris than it does for other places. So if we take Paris as this cosmopolitan metropole, which you describe it as, what really makes it, as you say, a training ground for intellectuals from all around the world? So, uh, yeah, the, the training ground metaphor isn't mine, of course. Um, so, and, and it's, it's, it's an old assumption about imperial centers which become the places in which colonial elites get educated. And in that sense, um, places like Paris have, have always been called a training ground. What I wanted to do in the book is to, to steer attention away from this training ground metaphor or qualify it, let's say, by looking not only at, at the education in, in a literal sense, as in 
you know, people reading Hegel and therefore becoming nationalists, which was, which was an old assumption in, in the literature about nationalism in, in Africa and Asia, and instead look at the everyday lives of, of um, people in, in Paris. And, and at some point in the book, I believe I call it a truncated school of citizenship. So, and the idea is that, that Paris becomes a place where, first of all, um, political freedoms are greater than they are in the colonies um, because, because metropolitan laws apply, which basically guarantee certain freedoms that, that are totally curtailed in, in, in the overseas empire. So in that sense, there's an escalation of expectations about, about what you can do, what the exercise of citizenship rights means and so forth. But then again, it's truncated. Because, because French authorities try to, try to, try to curb those freedoms um, to an extent that m is a mismatch with metropolitan law. And I wanted to look at how, how this mismatch is, is played out in, ev in the everyday lives of, of people from, in particular, French colonies um, who experience a different social environment than they, than they did overseas and how, how this becomes important as, a, if you want to call it, training ground for later post-colonial elites. Mm -hmm. So the title of your book mentions third world nationalism. Why use a term like the third world, which in recent years has really fallen out of vogue and been replaced by other terms such as global north and global south, mm. uh, and also a term which really only comes into existence during the Cold War period. So you're using it as a title of your book retroactively. Could you sort of unpack that a little bit, please? Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about that a lot of times and, and the, the short or easy answer is for, for lack of a better term, <laughs> which isn't a very good answer, I suppose. Um, but so, yeah, it's, it's an anachronistic term um, because it wasn't used in, in, in the interwar period on which I focus in, in the book. It was, it was attractive for me for several reasons. Um, so... First of all, I'm a scholar of nationalism, and I wanted to make a point in the book. So the book, in, in, in some ways, is about nationalism, and you can't quite have Global South nationalism, I don't think, or nationalism of the Global South. So, um, but you can have Third World nationalism because it was a term that, that, that was um, widely used un until the 1980s, at least, or so between the, the 60s and, and the 80s. Um, and but so the point in using this term is drawing attention to the fact that there were certain commonalities between those emerging nationalisms in, in formerly colonial countries, in which the actors and intellectuals that I look at see themselves as part of a greater whole, which in in the 1920s was, was often called oppressed nations or something like that. Um, but, but I wanted to look at, at the origins of something that was then later called uh, third world nationalism. But the other thing is, of course, that, that the term third world is, is, is a French invention. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was first used in the 1950s by, by a French uh, demographer who was biographically tied to the story that I tell in the book also because he, in the interwar period, was a specialist of um, migration to, to France. So, 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 so there is the, an additional smoking gun that, 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 that made use of the term attractive. Mm -hmm. um, so so those, those are the, the main reasons, I suppose. So you've already started to talk about nationalism. Um, could you address how nationalism evolves in, in Paris in response to, anti, uh, in response to imperial power? So, yeah, th there is a larger point about um, nationalism, which mostly comes in the, in the latest chapter, in the last chapter of, of the book. Now, I think the important thing to say, first of all, is that, that this is a very old historiography about nationalism in Asia and Africa that, that I deal with or, or in which my book is also embedded to some extent. But it also grew out of a frustration with that literature, which I think was overly concerned with ethnic nationalism and in particular transfer of ideas. Um, as I said earlier, you know, the, the idea that, well, Senghor, the later Senegalese president, at some point uh, stumbled into reading Fichte or Hegel and boof, out, out comes a nationalist. Mm -hmm. 
um, who then implements what, what he learned in Hegel in, in Senegal. Now, it's, it's pretty obvious, and I'm of course not the only one to say that, that th this, this is not really the case. And, and there's a more recent literature, um, of which Frederick Cooper in particular is, is, is a proponent, which uh, proposes not to treat people like Senghor as nationalists at all, mm -hmm. because they, they didn't have national independence foremost on their mind for a long time. They weren't so concerned with ethnicity, and what they really were concerned with were, were civic rights and, and citizenship in particular. What I try to do is, is to treat this as part and parcel of a kind of civic nationalism, so to speak. Um, and and, and this, is, th this is what ties their nationalism to their experience also in, in Paris in relation to, to citizenship, what, what I just said earlier. But, but in, instead of saying, no, this is not nationalism because this is about citizenship only, mm -hmm. I, I try to bring together those two strands um, of, of literature and, and therefore try to tie their experience in Paris also to a broader story about the spread of nationalism around the world after the Second World War. So your understanding of nationalism really is, is focused more on state building and citizenship as, as sort of political concepts rather than sort of cultural understandings of nationalism. I think it's both. Okay. But, but, um, but yes, my, my book, you're right in the sense that I, I would like my book to be a corrective to a literature that has focused only on the ethno-cultural aspects of nationalism and, and not sufficiently on, 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 on the civic side of things, which was absolutely crucial for, for the actors that, that I look at. Mm -hmm. So your book criticizes the approach of other historians who study migration and the relationship between one particular group and a specific location. And instead you call for increased attention towards a non-dualistic form of cross-cultural linkage. Um, can you please kind of elaborate on this claim? So yeah, the there is a literature, of course, or there, there, there has long been a literature about, um, let's say, this isn't a huge literature, but there, there are books, let's say, about Vietnamese students in interwar France or Algerian workers in interwar France um, and even about uh, Latin American intellectuals in Paris or, or, or things like that. I really wanted to bring those strands of scholarship together for two reasons. Um, first of all, I felt that the, 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 the compartmentalization into several um, bilateral relationships was artificial for two reasons. One has to do with the, with the prevalence of area studies. So people are trained in, let's say, African history, and then, and then that predisposes them to look at the relationship that Africans had with, with France or Paris. Um, rather than, than, you know, various people with, with, with uh, Paris. But also because archival cleavages uh, further exacerbated this artificial compartmentalization in the sense that, for instance, it was, it was a different French authority that dealt with Algerians than, than French authority that, that dealt with Vietnamese, which um, resulted in, in, two, in two paper trails which are deposited in different archives. So you go to one archive and you learn only about Algerians, except you're also except you're specifically looking for the links that Algerians may have had with Vietnamese, which was what I did. Um, so, 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 so that was one reason. I felt it was an artificial compartmentalization. The, the other reason was um, that I felt in many instances it was important for the development of the ideas of the actors that I looked at that they had such cross-cultural contact. Mm -hmm. um, so in particular, I look at one, uh, one association which, which is called um, the Intercolonial Union, mm -hmm. in which people from various parts of the French Empire sit together, and they very clearly extrapolate claims of one group and, and, then, and then apply it to their own context. So let's say West Africans start thinking about independence because, because they're Vietnamese peers um, on the board of the same group that they sit on, uh, talk about it so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wanted to capture this, this dynamic. 
Now, th th those are the reasons, those were the reasons for me looking beyond bilateral relationships at, at a group of several people. Now, in hindsight, it created a lot of problems also because, because um, I, I'm not a specialist in Algerian or Vietnamese history. I, I struggled to learn about all those backgrounds. I was in constant danger to misinterpret something that happened in Paris among the Senegalese because I didn't understand the Senegalese background. Um, so, so, so there's a lot of dangers in it also. And then uh, in addition to that, if you're looking for such exchange, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to, you know, have the common sense and honesty to say that, you know, the links between Latin American intellectuals and um, Algerian workers in interwar Paris were a lot more limited than would have been nice for my argument. <laughs> So, so, so there's certain dangers also in that. Um, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but ju just to, to stay with this topic of migration, really one of the central theses in this book is that migration itself becomes an engine for ideological change. And the, the contact between these different migrants uh, is, is really the sort of the force which is driving this. So can you sort of develop this a little bit more? Yeah, so, uh, so th this is the point where, <laughs> where I go into detailed examples, right, to show, <laughs> um, to, to show how this works. But again, uh, the, the larger argument is drawn out of a frustration with, um, with the focus in the literature that, that is predominantly on the history of ideas. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I looked at my actors, some of whom, let's say, Mesali Aj, uh, an Algerian, worker who in the 1920s from Paris emerges as really the, 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 the most important um, man in, 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 well, Algerian nationalism, if you want to call it that. Um, and for him, you know, uh, reading Marx um, or, or, um, or Maurice Barres, or let's say, I don't know, is, is, is eventually becomes important. But what first becomes important for him is um, you know learning what colonial law has to do with his personal possibilities to get a war veteran's pension, um, to give an Islamic name to uh, or Muslim name to his children, to marry a French woman he loves. So it's a lot. It has a lot more to do with his practical everyday experiences. Um, than, than, than with reading um, famous I ideas, let's say. Um, and, and, it, and it is this dynamic that, that politicizes him, mm -hmm. as, as happens to many other people, who you know, have to familiarize themselves with the intricacies of the entire colonial edifice, in particular in relation to law. Mm -hmm. um, so if, 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 I, if, I, if I learned one thing out of this research, that, that I didn't quite know so far before. Um, it, it is the importance of legal history, I suppose, mm -hmm. and, and how it ties to, to everyday experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so is your argument then that these individuals and groups were largely unpolitical before they came to Paris, and Paris itself uh, was responsible for this transformation, or that Paris as a space which held within it lots of different groups, uh, was therefore able to create this situation where uh, migrants came into contact with each other and politicized each other. So again, the, answer, the, the honest answer would have to be it depends on who exactly you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, Chinese worker students, um, some of whom later became very important in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, as, as, for instance, Zhao Enlai, or Latin American intellectuals, to some degree became, came to Paris um, uh, already uh, politicized in certain ways. This is less true of, uh, of Senegalese or Malagasy or Algerian soldiers and, and workers for whom their stay in Paris was, was, was really more obviously um, an engine of, of politicization. So the short answer is it, it depends on, on the group in many ways. Now, but, but the larger problem in answering your question is that 
Paris can't be isolated entirely from the places of, of origin. Uh, because it's not like people go to Paris and then stay for the 20 years that I look at in Paris, but they go to Paris for three years, then they go back to their place of origin, stay there for three years, and, and then go back to Paris or another place, and then go through Paris or something like that. So it, it's hard, precisely because it's such a cosmopolitan and connected environment, it's hard to isolate Paris as, as, as a place totally distinct from, from the places where they come from. So, for instance, take southern Vietnam from where a lot of uh, students come, come to Paris. And some of them come already politicized to Paris. But then again, you can argue that some of them are politicized by returnees from Paris. So, so there's one person in Paris, goes back to Saigon, and then draws others, certain you know, school colleagues, or like to Paris. And so, so there's obviously transnational long distance contact between them, which makes it hard to say, well, you know, they had no political background before they came to Paris, and then it all happens there. Um, but, but, but the place is, 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 is connected in many ways. So, <laughs> so we've talked about these, these, these groups and, and, and migrant intellectuals that have come to Paris and their influence upon each other. What was the influence that these groups and individuals had upon French intellectuals? Paris being in particular a space which has produced a long history of radical uh, intellectual thought throughout the 19th and 20th century. Mm. So, yeah, that, that's a question that I'm often asked about the book. Um, and it's a question, I believe, that comes out of the demand of post-colonial studies that we have to look at how the colonies also impacted on on Europe, which they did, although I'm pessimistic about the extent to which the people that I look at in my book really had um, a direct impact on French political and intellectual life at the time. Um, now, uh, for instance, so, so first of all, there, there's not enough of them um, to, to, really, to really have such a political and in intellectual impact on, on French public life. There's also a very hierarchical relationship between them and French intellectuals. So even, even the most open to, even the, most open to, the, to the influence of uh, intellectuals from, or thinkers from the global south, which would be basically Marxist and, and communist intellectuals in, in interwar France, in particular Henri Barbus, for instance, even those don't seem to be normally very much influenced by Ho Chi Minh at the time. This is really something I think that, that comes in the, in the 1960s um, when the French New Left massively becomes influenced by, by events in what then is called the Third World and, and not so much of, of my period. So. I don't believe that, that there is such a large impact. And again, also, if you think about elections, um, the colonial issues, as I say in the book, are rarely decisive in French elections at, at the time. Um, so if there are influences from the colonies to, to France, I think they're more subtle. Having said all that, the story that I tell in the book is important as, 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 a, as a precursor of the social history of post-colonial migration to France. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in that respect, the people I look at are, are the pioneers, so to speak, which, which in many ways prepare the, the grounds for, for something that happens on a much larger scale later. So, so in that sense, um, it, it is very important. But, but in terms of you know, swaying public opinion in France, I, I, I don't think there, there's such a big impact at the time. We're going to take a step back now from your book uh, to talk about this, the field of global urban history, which in many ways your book could be seen as a prime example of. Um, could you perhaps explain this field and perhaps the genealogy uh, behind it? Urban history. Um, but, but I don't quite think that that makes a field. Um, but I, so I, at some point I began to think of my book as an instance of 
global urban history, if, if you like. Um, but the but the interesting part in that is perhaps more the urban than than the global, <laughs> and it came out of out of um, instances where where I presented my book and people pushed me towards foregrounding the urban dimension of it more. Similarly to your questions, a lot of people ask me, well, you know, what's the specific Parisian dimension of the story? And, and even more specifically than you ask, now tell me about, you know, tell me about, is there something in the urban space of Paris, in the way space is organized in the city of Paris, as opposed to other cities that, that has an impact on the biographies of the people that you look at? So, and then I try to, and, and, the, and the source material that I looked at, like police reports, uh, were very useful for that because, because I could see in which meeting halls they met, you know, even which metro lines they took every day. But at the end of the day, I, I was always very dubious about the extent to which the specific urban space of Paris had an impact on, on their experience. I, 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 I couldn't really put my finger on it. But, but anyway, the, the, so this got me going generally to think more about urban history and how urban space interacts with, with um, global or, or long distance connections. Um, in particular, I became interested in, in, in the issue of, of urban ethnic segregation, mm -hmm. which in some ways in, in the late 19th century and early 20th century uh, is, you know, a, a spin-off of, of long distance connections because because often the the most segregated groups like say Chinese in Singapore um, are are migrants um, so, so 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 this is the the genealogy of 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 looking at this but from a, from a larger angle it was also that 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 I realized that urban history which oh let, 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 let's go back one step in global history there's there's often the demand to look at how the global manifests itself in the local and how the local manifests itself in the global. It is demanded so often that it's become a cliche, really. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, when you, when you look at the output um, in terms of books, there's a lot more that show how the global is manifested in the local than vice versa, which, which, is, which is harder to show. Um, Plus, I felt that urban history, which is, which is a local field by, par excellence, um, is, is a particularly res resiliently Eurocentric and North American-centric field of history, which has been reformed a lot less than other subfields of history by, by those recent claims about the global and, and all that. So, so uh, global urban history, in a way, was, was, was an attempt open-ended attempt to, to... So is, is, is global urban history then really an attempt to corral global history, a term and a field which at some points becomes a bit over-expansive sometimes um, and perhaps relies on slightly amorphous ideas such as networks and entanglements? I think so, yeah. So it, it, it is, well, it is an attempt to to empirically ground urban uh, sorry global history in, in specific places mm -hmm. and and those specific places can be or uh, are, are often cities because because cities and port cities in particular and especially port cities that grow in the late 19th century <laughs> um, of which there are many are, are the places where where long distance connections are most most acutely condensed let's say so so, so they they are especially appropriate to look at what long distance connections do in in particular places um so yes fr from from the angle of of global history it, it is an attempt to to ground this in 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 specific um empirically grounded and also manageable units um let's say so can you explain how a history or and a historian of Latin America came to write a book about Paris and become involved in this new field of global urban history? 
Yeah, so by accident, <laughs> or, or, or as, you know, the, the more sophisticated term would be because of contingencies. <laughs> no, just because, so I, yeah, my first book was on nationalism in 20th century Argentina. It was a book of intellectual history, mostly, intellectual and political history. And as I said earlier, I, I became interested in Paris as a place for, for the exchange of Latin American intellectuals. But then as I went to French archives, I found very little about Latin Americans and a lot more about people from French colonies. So, so that's how the project developed. Um, and, and then it became about Paris and, it, and then it increasingly became about um, urban space and increasingly less about grand ideas and you know, specific social history of, um, of small places. So, so, so that's how it developed and, and how I ended up there. And what would you say are the potential futures uh, for these fields, or you yourself and, and the way in which your career is moving? Uh, how, how do you see these things developing uh, in the future? You mean global history and urban global history, history, let's say? Exactly. Yeah, so I, I, I can see... So in terms of... Uh, with, with regards to global history, I can see... in increasing unhappiness with a kind of imperial overstretch of global history. Um, the term has, has become so pervasive um, that, that, that people find it increasingly hard to, to, to understand what, what, it, what it means, but also what it, what it should do analytically. Although this might be a perspective um, that comes from someone who's, who's surrounded by people who use the term global a lot, right? If you if you if you go away from 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 our little Berlin cocoon here, let's say, and and and, and go elsewhere, uh, th this looks pretty different um, still. So 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 I don't think, in that sense, that that global history is exhausted. But I I do th I do see um, a particular a move in global history. Um, so it's trying to, to ground it um, more more empirically, um, and and in that sense, uh, you know, lo looking at cities is, is probably um, part of the zeitgeist in, in that in that respect. Uh, with regard to urban history, I, I can see a lot of people in urban history who are now captured by the by the global turn and and use the vocabulary a lot, without necessarily involving a great deal of empirical change yet um, so I, I I don't know where 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 that's going in in the future but I I would suppose that increasingly subfields such as urban history um, are are caught up in the wider demand to look at long distance connections at transnational issues and so forth it's a hopeful word for the future. Um, so now, just to end on a slightly lighter note, um, if there was any moment in history which you could personally experience, uh, what would you like that to be? Wow. It, uh, it's <laughs> well, it should be exciting, yet not too dangerous right, to be caught up in it, which, which, um, which, which makes it uh, difficult. I, I, I suppose I was I was brought up with a lot of imagery of of 1920s Berlin and that kind of stuff. Then my book was on the 1920s, so the, the obvious answer would be well, you know, um, some large city in the 1920s. But this this might be because because it's the it's the context I know best, and and the more you learn about the context, you more get intrigued. Um, about it, and, and the more you wanna you, you wanna be in it, um, or or nineteen thirties Shanghai maybe before before it becomes you know really messed up, let's say. Um, so go out be, be before it becomes too dangerous, something like that maybe. So perhaps on a train between Paris, Berlin, and Shanghai. Yeah, although I, I I'd probably get bored um, in, in between uh, Berlin and Shanghai somewhere. <laughs> and one final question, uh, if you could have dinner with any historical figure, uh, who would that be? Wow. Um, I, I, maybe um, Karl Marx, because after that I'd, I'd, I'd have 
most stories to, to tell colleagues about it that they would find intriguing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much, Michel Goebel. Thanks for having me. And if you'd like to learn more about Michel Goebel and his latest work, Anti-Imperial Metropolis, uh, or find out about the work of uh, global urban history, you can find out more on his blog, www.globalurbanhistory.com. Thank you very much.